Aren't we glad Pastor got down those steps safely? <laughs> it's not uh, often you get to dispel myths so quickly. But I'm sure there are many of you thinking, I bet Mark doesn't even own a jacket and a tie. <laughs> Actually, I have only one jacket, but I do have two ties. So, you know, I uh, sometimes get up in the middle of the night, four or five in the morning, and I uh, uh, can't get back to sleep on a Sunday, especially. And so, I listen to the radio. I put it on my little transistor. Those things still exist. My headphones, so I don't wake, wake Karen up. And I try to find a church service, and it's next to impossible between the infomercials and whatever else is on. But there is one church, not far from us actually, that does have their morning service on at 5 a.m. on Sunday morning. And so I listen to it because uh, the music is very, it's very traditional. It's all hymns and organs and the scriptures are read and it's very formal. Some would say it's very old fashioned. Uh, and then the sermon comes. And I'm inevitably disappointed because what I don't hear is a sermon, I hear a speech often a very good speech about things I may or may not believe in, but it's not a sermon. And I praise God that whenever I come here on a Sunday, I hear a sermon from our pastor. I hear the, the scriptures exegeted in an expert way. I hear the word of God proclaimed. And brothers and sisters, that unfortunately is a rare occurrence and becoming rarer. We ought to praise God for our pastor and his preaching. We're celebrating uh, Pastor uh, and Christie's uh, fifth anniversary. Uh, most of Pastor's ministry life is ahead of him. Uh, I'm celebrating an anniversary as well this year. Uh, I was appointed by Missions Door to be a missionary 40 years ago. <laughs> Which means that for me, most of my ministry life, I'm looking back at. And you know, when you've been in ministry for 40 years and even longer, 40 years with the mission, people often wonder, well, what, did, what have you learned? What pearls of wisdom have you come up with that you can share with other people? And uh, you know, there are some things you learn over 40 years of ministry. Uh, but there's one thing in particular I wanted to share with you this morning, because uh, it's sort of become more and more crystal clear to me over the last few years. I've almost adopted it as a, a mantra in my ministry. Um, I believe that fruitful ministry has two components. Whether it's talking about your personal ministry, whatever God has called you to do, whether, whether it's talking about our church as a whole, missionary endeavor, whatever it is, fruitful ministry has two components. It must honor God and it must work. Fruitful ministry always honors God, and it always works. And you know what happens when those two things are not present in a ministry? We learn that by looking at an Old Testament character, King Saul. And I want you to take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be looking at a few episodes in the life of King Saul and we're going to see the, how Saul failed at both those things. How his ministry, his activities as king, both did not honor God and did not work. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. Now I normally read out of the New International Version. That's my uh, translation of, of choice. But you know these stories, some of them are very familiar. And the, the way it's put in the message is so vivid, the language is so vivid, I thought I would read, with your permission, and I assume I got it, out of the message this morning. I'll read a few uh, uh, passages also from the NIV, but I'll be reading primarily from the message, and so if it happens to differ uh, from what you're reading, you'll understand why. But 1 Samuel chapter 15, look at verses 13 through 21. Just to set this up, God had given King Saul a specific command. He told Saul to annihilate the Amalekite people. Now this was uh, something that would happen on occasion in the Old Testament where God would command that a people, because of their wickedness and rebellion and absolute uh, beyond the whole 
uh, any hope status, they were to be completely annihilated. Men, women, children, animals, buildings, the whole thing. That race of people was supposed to be wiped off the face of the earth. That's what God told Saul to do with the Amalekites. And uh, he thinks he's done that, and so he's uh, just returned from erecting a monument to himself <laughs> for his great victory, and he meets his mentor Samuel, the prophet Samuel. And uh, this encounter happens beginning at uh, verse 13. As Samuel came close, Saul called out, God's blessings on you. I accomplished God's plan to the letter. Samuel said, so what's this I'm hearing? This bleeding of sheep, this mooing of cattle. Only some Amalekite loot, said Saul. The soldiers uh, say back a few of the choice cattle and sheep to offer up and sacrifice to God, but everything else we destroyed under the holy ban. That's the term used to describe this total annihilation of a people. Enough, interrupted Samuel. Let me tell you what God told me last night. Saul said, go ahead, tell me. And Saul told him, when you started out in this, you were nothing, and you knew it. Then God made you king over Israel. Then God sent you off to do a job for him, ordering you to put those sinners, the Amalekites, under a holy band. Go to war against them until you have totally wiped them out. So why did you not obey God? Why did you grab all this loot? Why, with God's eyes on you all the time, did you brazenly carry out this evil? Saul defended himself, verse 20. Saul defended himself. What are you talking about? I did obey God. I did the job God sent me, set for me. I brought in King Agag and destroyed the Amalekites under the terms of the Holy Band. So the soldiers saved back a few choice sheep and cattle from the holy band for sacrifice to God at Gilgal. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Verse 20 is at the same time one of the most tragic and one of the most pathetic verses in the Bible. Saul was given a task to do and he thinks he's done it. And he's defending himself. I did it, Lord, I did it. You ever do that? Ever have a conversation like that with the Lord? Yeah, Lord, I did it. I did it. And God's saying, no, you didn't. Did Saul carry out the command God gave him? Absolutely not. The Amalekites, some of them, some of their animals, the king, they were still around. They were still alive. Saul thinks he's honored God, brothers and sisters, because he intended to honor God. There's a big problem, brothers and sisters, when our intent is a substitute for our obedience. Because we only honor God when we obey what he has given us to do. Had God been honored here? Of course not. Why not? What had Saul done to dishonor the Lord in this? He did something that we often do. He put a wedge, he drove a wedge between what God had commanded him to do and what he understood the intent of what God wanted him to do to be. The wedge between God's command and God's intent. And that is a very dangerous thing to do. But brothers and sisters, before we dismiss Saul as someone who is acting in an absurd, ridiculous manner, look at our own behavior. Look at your behavior. Look at my behavior. For instance, do you remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5? These words are very familiar. Jesus said, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Well, I know Jesus said that. I wonder what he meant by that. Is that a legitimate question? He means what he says here. But you see how easy it is to put a wedge between what the Lord says and what he intends to say, or at least what we think he intends to say? Why is that so easy? Because, brothers and sisters, God's command so often clashes with my own values and behavior. And that, that startles me and shocks me. And so I want to deal with it by driving a wedge between what God asked me to do and our own behavior. And that's what Saul does here. He does something else here. 
He takes the gap that he has created with that wedging between God's command and his intent, and he inserts his will there. He puts his will there and mingles his will with God's will. Do we take at his word, brothers and sisters, or do we redefine God's will to fit our will, to accommodate our desires and our wishes? God's will must always override my will. God's will must always override your will. Our, God's commands to us come to us through the scriptures. And we must follow and obey what the scriptures teach us, brothers and sisters, because the scriptures are absolute. They have total authority. They're always right. They're always true. The scriptures are absolute and they're universal. They're always true in every situation. In every situation, Saul failed to honor God and failed to obey him. If we begin to think that the way we approach something, so long as what the end result is good, the way doesn't matter. But brothers and sisters, that is not true. God is concerned about the way we do our ministry as well as what we accomplish through our ministry. And that is critically and vitally important. We don't honor God if we don't honor him while we're accomplishing what he's called us to do. The result is simply not honoring to the Lord. I'm reminded of some sobering words that the Apostle Paul said in his first letter to the Corinthian church. This is uh, from chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. Just listen uh, to what Paul said about what we've just been talking about. Each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because they will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even, as though, uh, even though only as one escaping through the flames. You see what Paul is saying there? Brother or sister, in your own particular ministry, in accomplishing what God has called you to do, and he's called each and every one of us to do something, you have a commission by God to do something, brothers and sisters, through this church because this is the body of Christ through which he's called you to become a part of. And this church is not complete unless you're doing what God calls you to do. But brothers and sisters, as you build, as Paul says here, be cautious. What are you building with? Because there are going to be people that stand before our Lord Jesus Christ one day and they will present all the things they think they have done for the Lord and what will happen? They'll be burned up. They will be proven to be utterly worthless. They'll be saved. They're not going to lose their salvation. That's impossible. But all that they've labored to do that they think they've labored to do for the Lord will be gone. Don't let that happen to you. That's what happened to Saul here. What he did did not honor God and was not acceptable to God. That's the first critical thing. If you're going to have a fruitful ministry, brothers and sisters, what you do has to honor God, the way you do it as well as the result of what you do. But I began by saying there are two critical factors in a fruitful ministry. Certainly it must honor God, but it also has to work. It has to be effective. Did Saul's plan, did King Saul's plan succeed? Was he successful? And if we're to read the scriptures, we have to admit for a time it did. Saul was successful in what he did. His strategy was to build an army. He was surrounded by hostile armies. The little nation of Israel was there, newly formed, and around were all these angry, hostile people with these big armies. And so Saul's strategy was to develop an army to combat the armies around him. And he was successful at that. It says at one point he fought valiantly. That was his strategy, and for a time his strategy worked. But Saul discovered something that many leaders do over time. After they've exhausted their own personal efforts, their own personal skills and human 
drive that they bring to the table and they turn around to lean on God, they realize something. They realize they left God behind years ago. They've talked a lot about God, but they've never really depended on God. And Saul discovers that. And he discovers something else as well. He discovers that his strategy doesn't work anymore. It's no longer effective. Look at chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. Chapter 17. Look at the verses 2 and 3 of that text. 1 Samuel 17, verses 2 and 3. Saul and the Israelites assembled and uh, camped in the valley of Elah on, and drew up their battle line to, to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. Saul was proceeding as usual. The enemy had changed. It was no longer the Amalekites. It was now the Philistines. And so Saul was drawing up his battle lines. That's what he was familiar with. He was going to lead his army into battle against the Philistines. And so he's drawing battle lines and the whole thing here. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. The environment within which Saul was to carry out his command totally changed. In this case, very quickly, rapidly, almost instantly. And he was lost. Look at what it says in verses 4 through 10 of 1 Samuel 17. Very familiar story. A giant nearly 10 feet tall stepped out from the Philistine line into the open, Goliath from Gath. Goliath stood there and called out to the Israelite troops, why bother using your whole army? Am I not Philistine enough for you? So pick your best fighter and put him against me. If he gets the upper hand and kills me, the Philistines will all become your slaves. But if I get the upper hand and kill him, you'll all become our slaves and serve us. I challenge the troops of Israel this day, give me a man. Let us fight it out together. When Saul and his troops heard this Philistine challenge, what? They were terrified and lost all hope. What had happened? What had happened to change everything so quickly? Well, Saul was no longer facing an army, was he? All the armies were there. But now he was facing one man, a giant, but one man. And that one man issuing that challenge did what to Saul and his army? It froze them in place. They were terrified and without hope. They faced a brand new challenge. Saul, King Saul faced a brand new challenge, a different context within which to carry out what God had commanded him to do. Did that ever happen to you? Maybe your neighbors change, somebody moves the next door, or your business changes, or whatever, and all of a sudden the things you've been doing that you've been working at don't work anymore? That's what was happening here to Saul. What should work all of a sudden doesn't work. And into this standoff between the giant and Saul and the Israelite army comes a young man, a young shepherd. You know who his name is? David. That's right, David. David had uh, been sent by his dad to bring some food to the troops. His, his brothers were in the army, and he was bringing some food for them. And David gets there, and, and he hears this challenge coming from Goliath. Goliath did this for at least 40 days issued this challenge. And so David hears this. He hears this, this bragger, this, this Philistine, this giant, uh, defaming God and defaming the, the troops of God here. And he's incensed. God's honor is at stake, and he wants to honor the Lord. And so he goes to Saul. And he says, Saul, I can do this. I can take this guy. I can fight him. Well, a shepherd against a giant? Well, he thinks he can. He thinks he can. And he gives Saul his credentials, to show Saul how he could defeat the giant. Look at verses uh, 34 through 37 and see if this sounds like the credentials you would take into battle with you. I've been a shepherd, David says, tending sheep for my father. Whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I'd go after it, knock it down, rescue the lamb. If it turned on me, I'd grab it by the throat. And break its neck, that's a lion or a bear, and kill it. Lion or bear, it made no difference. I killed it. And I'll do the same to this Philistine pig 
who was taunting the troops of God. God who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. Well, that sounds like a brash young shepherd, doesn't it? Uh, what chance did he have against a giant? But you see, Saul was desperate. He wasn't going to go out and fight Goliath. None of his troops were going to go out to fight Goliath. And so if this young kid wants to come over and, and hey, maybe he's got a puncher's chance. My dad used to use that term. My dad was a boxer. And, you know, he could lose the whole fight on points, but then if he got a punch, you could knock the guy out in the last round. Well, maybe David had a puncher's chance. And so he wants to prepare David for the battle. How does Saul prepare this young man to go up against Goliath? What he does is what we so often do. He tried to fit David into the old way of doing things. Things that had stopped working, he tried to fit David with that. Saul does what we often do. He keeps doing what doesn't work. There is a difference, brothers and sisters, between what should work and what does work, between the ideal and the real, between theory and practice. Let me quote a profound uh, thought from one of my heroes when I was a kid. A very deep philosopher that uh, sometimes his words seem impenetrable, but let me quote them and see if you could understand them. Of course, the great philosopher just died a few months ago, Yogi Berra. Played catcher for the Yankees. One of my heroes as a kid. I know there's too many Mets fans here, so, but let me, let me just read what Yogi said. This is, he tries to capture that idea. Yogi said, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. But in practice, there is. Does that make perfect sense? In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. But in practice, there is. In case you're still trying to figure that out, let me give you my translation of Yogi's profound statement here. In theory, what should work always does work. But in practice, what should work often doesn't work. And that's what Saul was up against here. What was supposed to work was that you go into battle wearing armor. You take a sword with you. That's what he was used to. That's what soldiers do. That's how he had always fought all these battles. So what does he do to David? Well, look what he says in uh, verses 38 and 39. It says, Then Saul outfitted David as a soldier in armor. He put on his bronze helmet, or put his bronze helmet on his head, and tied, uh, belted his sword on, on him over the armor. David tried to walk, but he couldn't, could hardly budge. David told Saul, I can't even move with all this stuff on me. I'm not used to this. And he took it off. What had worked before stopped working. It had become useless. Brothers and sisters, don't allow that to happen to your ministry, whatever it be, in the Lord, where what you do becomes useless to God. In fact, it's worse than that. Because what happened here, if David had worn that army, that armor into the battle, it had become an obstacle to what God wanted to do. You know, we could, we could try to honor God with what we do and realize that what we're doing is actually putting an obstacle before what God wants to accomplish? I don't want to be found in that place. This reminds me, doesn't it, of something Jesus said in the Gospels in Luke chapter 5, very familiar words. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. Saul's way no longer honored God. And Saul's way no longer worked. It was David's way that would bring honor to God. It was David's way that would work. Why? Because David's, uh, David's way of doing things fit the challenge. He fit the new environment that they were in. What he did honored God. You look back at verse 36 of the text. You can see here that he, uh, David was motivate, motivated by honoring the Lord because this Philistine giant was defaming God. And he was going to put a stop to that. He was motivated by honoring God. That should always be the central part of whatever motivates us to accomplish what God has given us to accomplish. We want to honor God. And David's way worked. 
he brought a very uh, uh, unorthodox way of dealing with a battle. Look at verse 40. Look at the tools that he brought into battle with him. He took his shepherd's staff with him. He took his shepherd's bag with him. He found five smooth stones and put them in his shepherd's bag. He took a slingshot. Hey, would this work? It did work. Why? Not the armor, not the sword, not all that stuff, but the shepherd's gear worked. Why? Because David brought indigenous skills and insider's understanding of what the challenge was. David was an insider with insider skills. He was not afraid of one-on-one -on -one combat. What was his credentials? You remember what he told Saul? What had he killed? Bear and a lion, single-handedly. And this is giant here. He was used to one-on-one -on -one combat as a shepherd. He had beaten bears and lions barehanded. Sure, this was a giant, but this was no different than what he had done before. He was indigenous to that. He, brought, he was familiar with, with the skills necessary to carry out the work. He also used indigenous tools. He used not the, the tools of a soldier, he used the tools of a shepherd because that's exactly what that environment called for. That's what would work. And so Saul, David used what would work and see what happens. Look at verse 45, verses 45 through 50. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Verse 47, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves you for the battle. It, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Verse 50, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. David did it any way that honored God and worked. Brothers and sisters, our mandate from Jesus Christ has not changed. The mandate we have has never changed and never will. But the environments in which we are called on to carry out those mandates that God gives us changes all the time. You can just look at the history of our church and you can see how many times this church has successfully changed to meet the new challenges before it. And yet so often, we waste enormous amounts of time and energy and effort on what's supposed to work instead of what actually does work. And we're tempted to think that it's the what we accomplish that God is uh, interested in not the why or not the how. And he's interested in the how and the why as well as the what. We must never forget that. Any way that honors God and works. I want to close with a passage from 1 Corinthians, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is a verse that the Apostle Paul uh, wrote, and it's always sobered me as a minister. I've looked at this uh, on occasion over the uh, my life as a minister for 40 years, and it's always sobered me up. Because here the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul had had so much success, so much uh, new churches being started, and people coming to Christ, and all this that he'd gone through. He's roughly in the middle of his ministry, and he writes this. Listen to what he says. I'm paraphrasing the first part of it. I discipline myself, and then he says this. So that after I have preached to others... I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Did you hear that? Paul is saying, Lord, I don't want to be disqualified. Sure, these other things have happened, but I'm still liable to fall on my face here and begin to do things that are unproductive and obsolete and not honoring to you and doesn't work. And he never wants to be there. Brothers and sisters, I pray that prayer for you and I pray for me and I pray for our pastor and his wife that we might never turn around and say Lord I've disqualified myself from what you called me to do what a tragic thing in anyone's life when they become useless to God instead brothers and sisters remember to be fruitful in what God has called you to be and to do you have to honor God and what you do has to be effective it has to work and if we remember that I think the Lord will bring much fruit 
into our lives individually and our life as a church. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you uh, humbled by the things we've seen here in, in your word. Uh, Lord, you call each of us to accomplish things for you. Uh, you set challenges before each and every one of us, individually and corporately as a church. And Father, we see what happened in the life of King Saul and how he disqualified himself because he did not honor you. He thought he was. He intended to. But, Lord, when it came around down, down to it, he disobeyed you. Father, help us not to be so wrapped up in what you called us to do that we don't pay any attention to how we do it because that never honors you. And, Lord, help us not to be stuck in the old ways of doing things, not to be frozen in place like, uh, uh, like Saul and his army uh, were when the challenge changed, when Goliath challenged them. Father, we are facing... Uh, constantly changing environments within which you call us to carry out your work. Things are very, very different all the time, and they're changing uh, more and more rapidly. Father, sometimes we, we uh, seem confused and lost in the change, and yet, Lord, we know that if we honor you and follow you, you will find a new way to do it. There will be others that come and, and help us to see how best to do what you called us to do. Let us never forget, Lord, that you call all of us in all that we do to honor you and to honor you by being effective in what you've called us to do, that we might do our ministries any way that honors you and works. We commit ourselves to that task in Christ's name. Amen.